There's no, no speed. speed control. Let's either full speed or off side. But electricity is flowing there, absolutely. And the heart is not a pump. And the heart is not a pump, right. And you shouldn't be working for money. Those three. <laughs> Those three are the, like the first one you mentioned is the most important. During Lemuria, Tony says, electricity existed outside our bodies. We had nothing like physical bodies then. And he goes, we passed through in Lemuria a crossing point of a lemon state. And at that point, then, electricity starts going inside of what becomes our physical body later. And in the 18th century, we cross this point again. And so what was inside of us in regards to electricity is now going outside. And do you see a picture of this? When we built our homes and we put the copper wiring into the home, and this will be creating more and more, we're building an image of our bodies, of our nervous system into our homes with all the wiring. Okay, and then we saw this picture before. Um, I wanted to show you a couple little things from the periodic chart, which my father says is what he believes in. Um, when we look at the, what they call the number of electron shells, it's fascinating. We start with one electron, we get to two. That shell is complete, then we start a new shell, then we start going up one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, we stop. What does that remind you of? Music. An octave. Then what? Another one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. But those are the electrons that don't actually exist. That's the number of, as a scientist, I would say that's the number of electrons that fill that third shell, or the second shell, or the first shell. Okay. So when I get two electrons, I now have a balanced shell in this one because it's so close to the nucleus. Now when I step out a little farther, I can support eight. But now it's weird because I got out to the third shell and I can only support eight again. Or is that true? Oh, look over here. My goodness. I start out one, two, and I stop. And after two, I start building in that third shell again. <coughs> this is how they conceive of it. I do question whether this is correct. I wonder, <coughs> when we get to 18, we have 2, 8, and 8 again. 8 plus 8, 16 plus 2. I have this 2, 8, and 8 again. So I, I'm going to say that actually I have 2, 8, 8, 8, and 2, or 2, 8, 2, 8, and 8, I don't know. And now I start building again. And now this continues and continues, and we've had multiple big bangs, multiple uh, supernovas to start getting up into these heavier and heavier metals. But notice, I never go above 18. And I start building these up to 18. Oh, and now something interesting happens. So is this supernova one, supernova two, supernova three, and supernova four, Four times eight is 32. Did all of these from here on arrive with the fourth solar system? Fascinating questions. I don't know the answer, but this goes on, as you can see, and gets quite heavy when we're way out to these sorts of sizes of things. But Alternatively, Steiner also says this atom, let's try to get to this concept of the atom, this is very important. 
the atom is nothing but coagulated electricity, but not the electricity that we've been talking about, this building, billiard ball that bangs in and knocks the last one of the pendulum out. And he says, thought is exactly the same substance. Thought and electricity is two sides of the same coin. Something the same of each of these. And that's what the atom is. Uh, I, I confess, I do not quite grasp that. I don't quite know what he means by this coagulated electricity. But for me, coming to understanding that is absolutely essential for understanding this world that we're entering with our mind. So the, by the end of this cultural age that we're in, the fifth paka, science will have reached the stage where man will be able to penetrate into the atom itself. But we have to have the right concept to do that. And I think scientists know much more than they're letting us know, and not by some conspiracy theory. But I think a lot of them are afraid to come out of the closet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it's beginning to happen. And guys like Rupert Schultz. How mystical it is. Right, how mystical this is. And it's very shaming to one to, to say, I think it's more mystical than we think. And they all blacklist him, and he doesn't get tenure or her. So when the similarity of substance between the thought and the atom is once comprehended, the way to get hold of forces contained in the atom will soon be discovered. And he goes, this is not a good thing, unless we've reached the point of selflessness. So now you can see why you can't penetrate, why it's so hard, because the good forces are holding this wisdom back from us because once we have it, unless we've reached the point of selflessness, we will use it for great evil, much greater evil than what electricity can carry today. So the attainment of selflessness alone will, be, will enable humanity to be kept from the brink of destruction. We're going to go there. But we can bring that war of all against all or some other thing just as bad much sooner. So we're actually being helped by this not being made known to us. But he says electricity is um, life light, but under the negative life influence. So the of the ethers, we have the fourth ether is the life ether. Its counterpart can be called the negative life ether. Some anthroposophists call it the nuclear force because China said it is an incredibly destructive one. And so many anthroposophists thought the creation of the atom bomb and I think they may be right. I just, I, I haven't come to that conclusion yet. But the, the atom bomb was the expression of finding this third force. Isn't there a book called Dirty Energy? Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah. Yes. So as light comes under the influence of this negative light ether, it becomes electricity. It is an ether still. And so you would think that light and electricity are opposites. And in fact, in one realm, they are opposites in the etheric. They are as far apart as you can get. But weight and light are cosmic. So when you get up to astrality and all, then the antithesis of light is weight. And we see this when the soul, our astral, our, what lives in the astrality, when we go to sleep at, light, at night, um, one's will is crippled. And one's will becomes active when we come into gravity again. Sorry. 
read the rest of this. And again, back to that light course from the 10th lecture, the phenomena of sound and tone and light are akin to the consciousness, conscious element of thought and ideation in ourselves, while those of electricity and magnetism are akin to the subconscious element of will. So this is an elaboration kind of what we looked at a little earlier. And then, as in the spiritual realm, we differentiate between the luciferic, that is akin to the quality of light, and the aramonic, that is akin to electricity and magnetism. So also must we understand the structure of the phenomena of nature. And I ask a question, that's from me. Is electricity a comparable wave in subnature as light is in supernature? Five minutes, okay. Now I've tried to bring in something on elemental beings in this discussion. And I'm going to fail, I'm afraid, because this is a much, much bigger topic and a very difficult one for most people. Um, if you want to learn all about the elemental beings, you can get my book back there, The Dance of the Elves. I'm kidding, I'm joking. But um, <clears throat> he refers to the earth elemental beings, the gnomes, as being akin to a one-sided developed intellect. And then the undines, or the water elemental beings, as akin to human feeling, and the air elementals, or the sylphs, to will. And we're now in a time when the intellect has begun to decline within the civilized world. Our intellect itself is falling into decadence. This is what we need Michael's help with. So if mankind is not to become receptive to what streams towards him from the spiritual world, then the result of this dullness on man's part will be that there are signs, and there are signs that are happening, that these elemental beings will gather together to form a kind of union and place themselves under the leadership of Aramon as the supreme leader of the intellect. If we lose these elemental beings to Aramon, we won't have lost the war, but it will be very difficult afterwards. Can you, can you, can you Could you give an example of how I can understand that in like a practical way or in a like in an illustration? Like how the elements being become under Aramon. What would that how would you illustrate that? So earlier today somebody I heard somebody saying um, uh, to somebody who was saying I always have trouble with my computer and technology. Um, and they answer, do you form a relationship to it? In the sense that there is a being, do you give it a name? Mm -hmm. Do you, in a sense, honor that being in serving you? Do you wash its feet, so to speak? Um, and When we do that, these beings love to help us. Mm -hmm. Everything in the spiritual world is being. There is being in everything. There is being in all of this technology. And we can form a relationship to those beings. Now, I'm beginning to reach my boundary on this. So um, mm -hmm. I will venture to step across to try to answer the question, but I'm very uncomfortable trying to answer questions about elemental beings. But um, if you can picture now these beings with whatever form of intelligence they have, that they experience their destiny to become, they, to be moving into the calculable world. They are becoming um, in a desire to form unions amongst all of those elemental beings.